Bueno, buenos días. Eh, dado que vamos un poco mal de tiempo, voy a presentar muy velozmente a los miembros de la mesa. Voy a empezar por Javier Cénica Celaya, que ya que está entrando por la puerta, así es como si fuera a recoger un Oscar, ¿eh? se, se acerca hacia las sillas. Bueno, Javier Cénica Celaya es eh, catedrático a la Universidad del País Vasco y tiene una larguísima trayectoria en investigación de la arquitectura tradicional, tradicional y menos tradicional. Además, ha sido editor de una revista que todos recordamos con mucho cariño, se llamaba Composición Arquitectónica, y, y nos suele acompañar en muchos de los debates más interesantes que tenemos en este campo. Michael Licudis es director de la Escuela de la Arquitectura de la Universidad de Notre Dame y presidente del de jurado del premio Driehaus. También es un investigador que tiene una serie de publicaciones y aportaciones que ahora no es el, no es el momento de detallar. Melissa del Vecchio es eh, socia del de el estudio Robert Stern y ha sido responsable de una cantidad de proyectos fascinantes, eh, realmente sorprendentes. También ha trabajado con Duaní y Platter Seiberg y eh, tiene una relación muy estrecha con el campo de la arquitectura tradicional. Eh, Manuel Blanco es catedrático de composición en esta escuela y además es el director de la escuela, así que eh, le hago reverencia como profesor de esta escuela desde el otro lado de la, de la mesa. Eh, es un experto en diseño, en, en moda, también es un gran aficionado a la arquitectura tradicional. Hemos tenido grandes debates sobre Plesnik, por ejemplo, ¿no? es un arquitecto que nos gusta mucho a los dos. Y León Crier, yo creo que lo mejor que se puede decir de él es que no necesita ninguna presentación y si tuviera que hacer una presentación, pues media hora sería lo mínimo que tardaría, así que la voy a omitir por completo porque todos ustedes saben quién es. Mm, supongo que eh, tengo que iniciar el debate o la mesa redonda con algún tipo de, de pregunta, con algún tipo de pretexto. Yo creo que me han puesto en esta mesa redonda porque yo suelo hacer preguntas perversas, así que voy a hacer una pregunta perversa y esa pregunta es eh, para que responda cualquiera eh, que quiera, sin orden ninguno. Esa pregunta es hasta qué punto en un mundo como el de hoy, tan modernizado y tan cambiado, la arquitectura vernácula tiene una, una relación orgánica con la vida que tenemos. Quizás sea más orgánica en unos países y menos en otras, pero... A mí siempre me, me corro esa duda, ¿no? Y me gustaría que los uh, miembros de la mesa dieran alguna respuesta. Yes, I, I think that it's very clear that vernacular and classism are profoundly bound. There's no classism without vernacular base. And virtually all the themes in vernacular architecture are constructive, have to do with construction, with stable construction. And that the forms which come out of I'm, I'm repeating platitudes, it's like, an, because I think that life is like a misa, like, an, you know, like a religious ceremony where you have to repeat every day, and when you don't pray, you repeat your, your beliefs, because it's by repeating that you verify and that they become true, because you share them with many other people. But it's a fact that vernacular architecture is technology, technology of building. And the crime of modernism is to locate vernacular architecture and isolate it in history and saying it was history, it's over, now we built the new, uh, the new architecture. And that is the crime which we try to, to correct because vernacular architecture is technology and classicism is an artistic translation of building technology, of the technology of building with natural materials. Synthetic materials change this, but they have not outdated it or rendered it meaningless. Well, if it goes this way, let's do it. <laughs> I am not really sure in this moment what we are talking about. Because I think we are talking about vernacular architecture, we are not talking about a style. Uh, we are talking about ODS, uh, objective. Uh, the development sustainable system now. And uh, I think we must talk about that in this uh, field. We are not talking about the way of uh, designing and designing details, beautiful details, even if that details made the architecture more rich Furthermore, may the city more rich, may the life more rich, because it's articulating in a way that we have lost. But we are talking about building systems that have proved 
through this study that it works very well for the development of the city and the sustainability is uh, guaranteed. And, uh, and for me, that's uh, very important in this moment that I have my university, the president of my university, with uh, circle, with colors, and going to New York uh, to, uh, to talk uh, about how our university is involved in that. Mm, I see that the marketing in this moment of vernacular architecture should be not a marketing of a style, not a marketing of conceiving how the city should be, but the marketing of sustainability. And it's something that can guarantee it. I'm coming now from the Ameri Ibero-American Biennale in Paraguay, in Asunción, and I was showing Leon Crier uh, Earth and Works, uh, an architect, Jose Cubilla, that is working uh, already buildings for uh, floors high uh, with earth. With earth and, 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 and looking, and the, and the building looking like the earth, and that wall of the earth, the quality is obtaining with that uh, terra pisonada. Sorry, I cannot translate terra pisonada. Huh? Yes, but in, in, with new technologies, a new way of doing it, but using the old system and guaranteeing a lot of different uh, isolation things that are needed. And in a moment that the Paraguayan architecture, Solano Benitez, the, the architect that wants to be a Pritzker, uh, he's doing things uh, with brick, and doing things with brick, even if the extraction are very daily, uh, he's doing in the old style of working with brick. And there are reinterpretations of all that architecture. And that is opposed, and that's the most contemporary and the most modern architecture that they are doing. But they are reinterpreting the old system of architecture in order to do that. And that's opposed uh, to the new bad commercial architecture that is invading uh, the country in this moment. <laughs> comentario a, a la pregunta de Rivera, el profesor Rivera siempre está con su chispa habitual. Eh, yo sí te he entendido bien que te diga hasta qué extremo hoy en día este asunto de lo tradicional estamos como fuera de onda, ¿no? En la sociedad contemporánea, ¿no? Pero yo creo que hay unos cambios tremendos que vienen, pero terribles, y mucho más, eh, ni siquiera imaginamos la que, la que nos viene encima, ¿no? lo digital, la globalización, eh, el mundo del comercio, ¿eh? ¿Cómo dices? Cambio climático, etc. Los cambios que vienen son tremendos. O sea, yo sí pienso que, lo cual no quiere que sea mejor el siguiente salto. Es decir, siempre se supone que los saltos son a, a mejor en el sentido de la modernidad, de la herencia que hemos recibido de la modernidad, de la ilustración, es que cualitativamente vamos hacia adelante. Se supone que es así el progreso, ¿no? Y espero que sea así, aunque hay, hay síntomas alarmantes. Acaba de decir el profesor Rivera lo del cambio climático, que, que no, es, no es broma. Pero hoy hemos visto aquí ejemplos eh, los, la, la, de, de, los de Mark y Nada Brightman, eh, los ejemplos de León, los de Mohamed, eh, los de los que han ganado los premios, muy hermosos actuaciones en Olite muy respetuosas, en Bejar, estas actuaciones en, en el mundo islámico, que ya es hora de que los países árabes se dejen de hacer Miami Beach en, 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 en los Emiratos, que cuando alguien sale de rascacielos se queda rostizado porque hay 50 grados de temperatura, no es broma, cuando un, un vecino de una torre en, en Qatar o, o, o en Abu Dhabi va a ver a su amigo a la siguiente torre, no va a llegar le va, dar, le va a dar un infarto. La mamá no puede sacar a su niño porque se, se le queda rostizado con el microondas. Es una cosa absolutamente criminal, absurda, que debe evitar a Miami Beach. Estos ya han corregido. Afortunadamente, y gracias a contribuciones como la de Mohamed, Jorge del Baquil y tantas personas, los árabes del mundo islámico y en Asia y en, y en Irán llevan construyendo ciudades hermosísimas pendientes del clima, evidentemente. Entonces, este sentido común milenario se está perdiendo. Lo hemos, hemos visto los disparates del Golfo. Uno rascación, a ver quién la hace más alta. Auténticas extravagancias. ¿no? 
Entonces, eso por un lado, ¿no? Hemos visto hoy proyectos muy hermosos, proyectos muy bellos, que bueno, que funcionan, funcionan. Y hechos con técnicas que son duraderas, que han demostrado durante décadas, siglos, que duran, son resilientes. Entonces yo no entiendo por qué tenemos que hacer siempre cosas raras, el triple salto mortal, el cuadro de salto mortal, eh, la mujer barbuda, el hombre de dos cabezas, cosas raras como en el circo, son innecesarias, son absolutamente innecesarias. Ahora, uno sí sale en la televisión, eh, ya no sabemos qué hacer, si hay que enseñar el trasero, si hay que dar un volatín en la, en la escena, y ya, es decir, creo que estamos un poco fuera de onda. Honestamente lo digo, y me entristece, porque si esto sigue así, entonces en ese contexto la historia hay que borrarla. Borre, en el fondo es una especie de amnesia. Es decir, si, si generamos una sociedad amnésica, pues siempre la manejaremos un poco mejor. Le venderemos cualquier lavadora. Y luego la lavadora ni lava, ni seca, ni nada. Es decir, bueno, para no irme con los dos dudas, yo sí pienso que estamos asistiendo a transformaciones preocupantes preocupantes. No quiere decir esto para nada, que la arquitectura que nosotros defendemos no sea la que hay que defender. Insisto, hemos visto los ejemplos tan positivos que para los países islámicos, Mohamed nos ha enseñado, León, etc., la Casa Patio, que ya es hora, ya es hora de que huyan de los Miami Beach, que, que los hemos visto en el Golfo, auténticos disparates. Y hemos visto cosas positivas, y hay cosas positivas. Y, y la herencia del pasado nos da un aprendizaje que tirarlo por la borda es de necios. No tiramos por la borda las recetas culinarias, la manera de vestir, cantidad de cosas que no tiramos, no tiramos por la borda de Velázquez, a Goya, no nos tiramos por la borda y nos quedamos con tapies. Es decir, eh, yo no voy a ponerme aquí a defender la crítica tradicional porque yo estoy en el imbao con unos amigos estupendos. Yo sí veo una situación preocupante, pero veo una situación, David señalado lo del cambio climático, bueno, eso es un tema gravísimo, la que viene, la que nos viene es parda, ¿eh? Entonces, claro, en el cambio climático, ¿qué modelo? O sea, eh, acabo, ¿eh? Eh, eh, En el cambio climático se dice que es antropogénico, es decir, somos los humanos quienes hemos llevado al planeta Tierra al límite. Y según la teoría de Lovelock, James Lovelock, el científico inglés, la Tierra ya no va a poder reaccionar a la, porque la, tenía un mecanismo de, de equilibrio, ¿no? Parte es el que se han perdido, dice Lovelock, que dicen los premios Nobel. Es muy preocupante esto, es muy dramático. ¿eh? Y tenemos que estar preparados para poder resistir el cambio climático, que incluso algunos piensan que ya ni eso. ¿no? En los Estados Unidos se están haciendo mapas para ver a dónde puedes ir a vivir por las zonas inundables. En fin, el cambio climático es un gran problema. Es un gran problema. Entonces, claro, si, si el cambio climático es antropogénico, vivimos el 50% en las ciudades, ¿qué tipo de ciudad tenemos que hacer? He citado el caso de los Emiratos porque es muy gráfico, no... es general este problema. La ciudad de Londres, la City de Londres, ya no se ve la catedral de San Pablo, está allí, encogida. La catedral de Cristo Ferrén, que había hecho tres cúpulas para que se viera, ¿no? está encogida, llena de, de rascacielos, no se ve. O sea, no es un tema solo de la, de la inadecuación al lugar de los Emiratos, o de la Arabia Saudita, o de Persia, o de lo que sea, porque esa inadecuación es general es general, arrastrados por haber quien hace el rascacielo más alto, quien hace la extravagancia, quien da el triple salto mortal en la tele, quien enseña el trasero, quien no lo enseña. Es una especie de frenesí estúpido, en mi opinión. Y estamos un poco en eso. Los programas de máxima audiencia en la televisión son programas deleznables, que no nos aportan nada. Es decir, parece ser como si la cultura, la historia, el pozo que nos han dejado, que nos han precedido, hay que tirar algo la borda. Me parece un disparate. Y en ese sentido, honestamente, eh, eh, David, yo sí, yo sí estoy preocupado. A mí me preocupa la, la que nos viene. A mí ya me pilla con una cierta edad, ¿no? Pero mis alumnos, por ejemplo, me preocupan, me preocupan bastante. Gracias. But I, I think, no, I can't talk with the headphones on. <laughs> I think that it's true, though, that the route to a true sustainability is like you're saying, is to start to look back and look forward 
at the same time to think about what vernacular architecture and traditional means of building can teach us to make a more sustainable world. I was struck by Raphael's talk this morning because usually when I come on this trip, I come for just a day and I go home. And this time I was able to come and go on a trip to Galicia where Raphael um, centered his talk. And I was so struck by two words that he used, which was language and landscape. Because it was so important to me seeing those buildings in Galicia, how tied they are to the, the landscape and the weather and the harshness of the climate, climate and the huge rocks that make up the coastline and then make up all of the buildings. And we were there and it was, it was very stormy and my husband said, oh, it's 90 kilometer winds outside. How nice it is to be in this stone farmhouse when there's 90 kilometer winds outside. And you realize that it's, it's so important how they take, um, how linked the architecture and the landscape and the materials that they use are. And I found myself, every picture that I took was about how these, not the buildings as objects, but the buildings as objects sitting in the landscape and how they were made out of the same materials as the landscape. And I think that what we lose when we build Miami Beach in Saudi Arabia is that you lose building a building that's related to the climate. And whether the climate is changing or not, if we're building things that are responsive, then each place will be different and responsive, and we can learn. We can learn from those situations to make things more more responsible, so that we're not building throwaway buildings that will tear down that don't work in their climate. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that has been said. Is this working right, or is it fuzzy? Sounds fuzzy. Anyway, um, you know, in the last sixty years. We have gone from a population on the planet from 2.5 billion to over 7 billion, and it's climbing. And how are all these people going to be fed? Okay, is this better? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sometimes they're close, sometimes they're close. Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, so the economics of feeding 2.5 billion versus 7 billion has changed dramatically. <coughs> At the same time, uh, the, the, the world is, has industrialized under the, uh, with, a, with the full compliance of all its people almost. Because you know, we all want our cell phones, whatever country we're in, we all want to have the latest gimmicks, uh, the, the latest fashions. And those people that don't want them, uh, well, we, we're going to make sure that you do want them. So uh, that, that's, a, that, that, that's a problem that is this unsustainable. We can no longer continue to consume period, what we've been consuming. And architecture has been a commodity, a consumable commodity. <coughs> vernacular architecture began as, a, an, a, as an economic way of building for the long term, uh, protecting the future, uh, making sure that people were safe, uh, that they also had a, a sense of commitment to the place. So the aesthetic, the, the economic, the political, mm -hmm. all of this aligned with vernacular architecture. The vernacular actually comes from the rustic, which comes from nature. So it goes back to the, we have to understand in the, in the modern world that either we, we think that, in, we falsely think that industry can sort of industrialize the planet to the point that it kicks <coughs> all nature out of it, or we say we've got to change the paradigm. In industrial economies, there is no such thing as reverence. I want to go back to the idea of reverence because I don't think reverence has been talked about much except in sort of scoffingly dismissed as some sort of neo-religious kind of thing. But reverence is at the core of what we all are here for because we have reverence for each other, we have reverence for our parents, our grandparents, our, 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 our descendants. We have reverence for all the things that make up this earth, some of the 1,000 or 2,000 year old redwood trees that are being cut down. You know, to all these species, millions of species that are disappearing off the planet. And the business, where are the business schools? Where are the law schools? Okay, well, there's a few schools of architecture that talk about these things. But we can't do it. Otherwise, we are always perceived as stylists. What we really need to do is mobilize the business community, the political community, and hope that you can, in fact, influence people. Now. The project that Leo showed and the Brightman showed and others showed today 
those need the business schools to come in with us and talk about the economics. Another name is building a real estate institute. And you know, the last images I saw, I have to be a little critical of my own institution, were just business as usual. There's no point in business as usual. We can't afford business as usual. We have to change it now. The model for real estate should be Cayala in, in, in Guatemala, uh, you know, San Miguel de Allende, uh, Amsterdam, that little, little enclave, which is amazing. If you think about what that enclave stands, stands for, that the Brightman's design. Because it, it has, it engages the early moderns, it engages the vernacular, engages the classical, the Byzantine, the Islamic, and yet when you look at the whole image, it's Amsterdam. So, and it, economically it works. It so, has social housing in it. Someone made the, the numbers work there. So why can't we make the numbers work on, on, on a world scale? But I'm afraid if we don't get everybody else on board and start teaching ethics the proper way, you know, the, the reverence for the environment, and making and giving the environment and all the things that come with it a certain value, uh, we will not win this, this uh, at least not without a, a terrible, terrible price. So, uh, I think everything that was said today is absolutely true, uh, but it, it's important that these other disciplines begin to understand the meaning of their role in all of this. Well, it just occurs to me that in order to do that, you have to create a, a, a real financial value to longevity. Because, you know, a lot of the systems that evaluate sustainable buildings nowadays, they simply evaluate, some of them mostly, energy consumption, and now they're switching a little bit to embodied energy. But there's very little value given to preserving an existing building that's only just beginning or to building a building that's going to, going to last for 200 years. You should, get, you should get more points for building a building of that quality in all of these systems. And right now you don't. And until, until there's a banking system that supports this and a legal system that supports creating real value to durability, I think you, you won't be able to get to that next step. Yo me encontré muy sorprendido esta mañana con algo que Rafael contó y es las repercusiones de Hacienda de la, de la preservación o no y que en vez de estar impulsando la preservación de elementos en un panorama arquitectónico que, que tienen que ser conservados y en vez de estar incentivada esa conservación se fiscaliza y esa fiscalización lo que provoca es la destrucción y, y honradamente Rafael muchísimas gracias porque nunca se me había ocurrido pensar que semejante barbaridad eh, pudiera estar uh, pasando eh, y ahí eh, me preocupa la destrucción de parte del patrimonio ya no de utilizar los elementos de la arquitectura vernácula en una nueva arquitectura vernácula que en el fondo es de lo que estamos eh, hablando, de lo que se está tratando aquí, sino de la preservación de elementos muy significativos que forman parte de nuestra memoria histórica, que forman parte de nuestro paisaje cultural y que tienen que ser eh, conservados. Y honradamente no sé cuáles son los instrumentos para intentar que eso no pase. Eh, probablemente tú desde la academia eh, puedas intentar cosas por el estilo y a lo mejor te podemos ayudar desde las escuelas pero eh, sí le provoco a Inbau España que, eh, que tome la iniciativa para que no solamente lo que se haga en el futuro sea adecuado sino que también eh, hable con quien tenga que hablar y nosotros lo apoyaremos I think how many people believe the story about climate change? <laughs> Because I think the climate change, climate has changed from the beginning of the universe. But you know, there, are, there are scientists who are not paid by 
by the fossil fuel industry, we say that is exaggerated. We don't know enough to, to model, to present the models which are now the official climate consensus. So, so, <laughs> this, uh, this um, last summer I was in a tropical city, in a tropical weather city, where suddenly the rain was pouring in uh, every day in expected moments, and I was very surprised to be in such a tropical weather because I was not prepared for it. And it's a city where I have spent a lot of summer in New York. And if New York had this summer a tropical weather, my dear, climate is changing. Climate means change. It has always changed. The French Revolution would have not have happened without a major catastrophic <coughs> climate change. India, India and China were in the 19th century, early 19th century, read, read the late Victorian Holocaust by Davis. Michael Davis. Climate has been catastrophic, century, century and millennia long. So to exaggerate now and make a political discourse is, is terror, is climate terror. There is no proof for, for saying that we can have any influence on the climate. It's mostly BS. But what I want to say, I mean, we are not here to discuss climate. We are here to discuss much more serious matters, which are uh, the future of mankind and what it will do with its bodies. We all have a body. We are, thanks God, nature has not yet become modernists. Babies are still born as babies. And they have a brain and they have incredible talents. And read Aristotle, who writes that the economy is not a result of the economy. The economy is shaped by human talent. And the crafts, which are the basis of, of the economy, are shaped by human talent, but what different babies and adolescents than adults can do with their hands and with their brains. And people who are extremely intelligent in mathematics can be complete idiots in cooking or in other matters. And so we are collectively intelligent, but we are not, nobody is intelligent. The most intelligent people are also extremely stupid. And that is why now very intelligent people who are intelligent in something are being asked to make intelligent pronouncements about climate, and they are idiotic. And people believe it. What is the most, my worry, our worry, your worry, is robotics and artificial intelligence. Because robotics are already changing the economy so much that if capitalism was really capitalism, most of the economy would collapse. Most German industries are, they are called by experts, zombie industries are maintained by low interest rates. They would not survive because the robotics are already so massively changing the production. And what do Hannah Arendt human condition, you have to read that. And I haven't said what will happen to a society of work, an industrial society, which is a society where humans, intellectuals, or body work is reduced to slave labor. Most people who work in offices are slaves. They are not creative. You know, people who sit in those damn offices out on the Castellana, they are slaves, as are the people who are slaves in the factories and in China and here. The utopia of mankind is craftsmanship, and they produce beauty with their hands and pleasure. And they only survive in very few branches of arts. Most artists are no longer producing art. They are thinking, and then produce a bit of red, and then people think it's art. Most museums of art are museums of non-art. I mean, the Catalans should be thrown down the no, stupid museums. There's no art in museums of modern art. But art is a product of great human skill which produces value. And that is what we are losing and what we have lost mostly. And that is why craftsmen is not, craft is not something of the past, but the 39 crafts which exist in, and you will listen to Irina's films on uh, Albarafin, where talk very bravely about in how far the crafts have shaped that town. 
imagine that all towns in Spain had done the policy of Alvaro Fini. Imagine what Spain would be like. Uh, so that is something which we, who are privileged profession, think about and we have to decide whether we help to make a society of robots and slaves or whether we maintain humanity in its skills as uh, Mahmoud or everyone here presented work, work with that skill of human, not just digital, but manual and intellectual capacity and artistic judgment. And that is what most schools are ill prepared for, most artisan schools have been closed. And that's why our building sites are really not only places to maintain crafts, but maintain language. Most of my project in the Kaila is done in concrete, because there's no other way we can build. Concrete for high seismic areas and so on, we have pillars, 50 to 60 to 90 centimeters concrete. But if you, you are even with concrete and steel, you are able to, make, to build a real town, which, is a real, which forms a real community, which is not made <coughs> and where different races and, and indigenous and Christians and, and Muslims meet and are friendly and behave well and love to be there and can send their children there without being scared. So that is the, what you engage when you become architects, whether you are going to continue a slave society, which is going to, to self-destroy and become more and more armed and, and self-destructive, or whether we are building and maintaining and reconstructing a world which was, you know, Was which we have the chance to stay little. Javier. Sí, yo solo un matiz. No, no es la cuestión del cambio climático, que ha sugerido eh, David. Eh, yo estoy de acuerdo contigo, León. Hay un terror sobre el cambio climático. Eh, muchas civilizaciones han sufrido cambios climáticos. Ahora sufriremos una más. El asunto es que el siguiente salto puede ser devastador. Entonces dices, claro. En España, por ejemplo, todos los años oímos el pantano de no sé dónde tiene un 10% menos de agua, no sé qué. Este verano ha sido más caliente que el anterior, el anterior más caliente que el anterior, el anterior más caliente que el anterior. No, es verdad. Bueno, esto es lo que dicen los epidólogos. Bueno, luego, eh, el polo norte se está fundiendo. Pero es que en, el, en la Antártida la NASA está siguiendo los icebergs que se desprenden. Los últimos icebergs tienen el tamaño del País Vasco. El País Vasco es una comunidad pequeñita, pero bueno, son tamaños considerables. ¿eh? Ahí ves. El norte, el norte, el sur. El norte se está fundiendo. El norte se está fundiendo. Pero en la Antártida, la NASA estudia. Y yo ahora no, voy a, no soy un experto en climático. Yo veo lo que dicen algunos científicos. Es verdad que se genera alarmismo y se puede hacer un gran negocio con el alarmismo. Y hay empresas oportunistas que hablan de un. Eso es verdad, porque siempre pasa. Pero hay datos que oímos constantemente de que se está incrementando la temperatura del planeta. Entonces, eso ha pasado muchas veces. El asunto, en mi opinión, es que quizás esta vez, cuando haya, haya subido la temperatura, no dos grados, como dicen algunos, a finales del siglo, hablan algunos de, de, de hasta seis grados. Quizás ya, pues sí, evidentemente la Tierra volverá a un equilibrio, la Tierra seguirá, pero la población humana, muchos nos habremos ido a... a por otro lado, claro, bueno, yo mi idea en Salvador. Vamos, el tema no es, no es, no es el tanto el cambio climático, sino lo que tú acabas de decir, lo de las máquinas, el gobierno de las máquinas. Sí, sí, no, pero... ¿Eh? No, una cosa solo, 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 un, solo un detalle, un detallito anecdótico. Hace poco leía yo que con esto del gobierno de las máquinas y los algoritmos, las grandes empresas para seleccionar personal meten determinados algoritmos y literalmente eliminan entre los candidatos a las plazas aquellos cuyo domicilio tiene un código postal de una zona muy pobre, porque asocian, la, as, asocian el origen de una zona muy pobre a, poca, a poco nivel para la empresa. Entonces, si tienen que seleccionar entre 2.000, 3.000 candidatos, etc., utilizan algoritmos para simplificar la lista de selección y en vez de seleccionar entre 2.000 o 3.000, seleccionan entre 100. Quiero decir, el gobierno de las máquinas viene, o sea, eso es evidente. Me vas a perdonar, pero Julio César se convirtió en pontífice máximo para tener una dirección, la domus pública, con una buena dirección y poder hacer carrera política. Sí, porque si vivía en la suburra, no podía hacer carrera política. O sea que eso sí que no es nuevo. Y estoy de acuerdo con lo que estás diciendo.
muy, muy, muy chocantes. Bueno, un pequeño golpe de estado, vamos a dejar de hablar de estos asuntos y vamos a volver a la arquitectura. Y les voy a hacer una última pregunta para que me deis vuestra opinión. Eh, creo además que tiene mucho que ver con lo que hemos estado viendo. Si sí, es cierto que la arquitectura vernácula probablemente, esencialmente, es un asunto de tipología, es un asunto de clima, es un asunto de tecnología, de, incluso de paisaje y de urbanismo. Sin embargo, hay una cuestión muy importante donde todos estamos siempre insistiendo, que es el estilo, las formas. ¿no? Es muy importante en las escuelas de arquitectura y es muy importante para todos los arquitectos que trabajan en la arquitectura tradicional. Entonces yo, a mí, cuando antes he visto fotografías, por ejemplo, de Hausmann, ¿no? de Hausmann que, que fue, es un París que ahora no me gusta mucho, pero los románticos y los tradicionalistas protestaron muchísimo contra la, el París de Hausmann, como es bien sabido. Y, o por ejemplo, pienso en el caso de, de Londres, cuando Íñigo John se iba a la arquitectura clásica, que ahora asociamos tanto con Inglaterra, y se embargo una arquitectura extranjera, que fue percibida como extranjera, y, y que acababa con todas las tradiciones locales eh, anteriores, jacobitas, etcétera, que había en, en Inglaterra. ¿no? Entonces ahí se demuestra que los cambios, las transformaciones de estilo han sido también constantes, como el cambio climático, y, y es una cuestión que a lo mejor tenemos que enfocar con una escala más grande. ¿no? Y entonces, ¿hasta qué punto hacer arquitectura vernácula implica también utilizar formas concretas de la arquitectura vernácula anterior y no podemos usar otras nuevas? Bueno, uh, I have been teaching for 40 years. <coughs> With every seminar, I always had one student who investigate how to extend modernism into real building language. The results were never quite satisfactory, so I have now for two years been working on the ninth volume of Le Corbusier. Obviously translated, completed, and corrected. Because I tried to prove that even with monism you could do an attractive thing. Which you never have. Most modernist towns are a disaster. The new town which is being built next to the Te Quattro is a horror of unimaginative forms and, and uh, it's a suburb, monstrous suburb. The American mathematician David Berlinsky, a genius in mathematics, but he lives in Paris opposite Notre Dame. So he was asked, what do you think of these projects which the great star architects have produced for Notre Dame? And he said, modernism produces, the only thing which modernism can produce <coughs> is spasms of ugliness, spasms, <coughs> you know, cramps, uncontrollable outpours of ugliness. And people have, uh, are now so tired of it that they don't even protest anymore. They think it's normal to have ugly buildings. But why do people visit historic places? Well, who cares about history? Most people who are tourists who go to visit Palma de Mallorca or Dresden or or Rotenburg or, or Central Paris. They don't go there because they want to know about history. They go there because it's beautiful. And beauty inspires love, uncontrollable love. If you see something beautiful, you go crazy. Pornography is an inspiration of love for something which we lost. It's a nostalgia for something for beautiful form. Eros means love. And what is erotic suggests love. And so ugly cities suggest hate and fleeing from it. And that is what the most beautiful Spain was. Donald Gray, our dear Donald Gray, who is now in heaven, suddenly of architect. He said when he came to Spain, he was not an architect, he was a teacher of English. He fell in love so much Spanish architecture that he became an amateur architect and he did the most beautiful ensembles in Spain. He was not an architect. I abandoned architecture studies after one year because you, the architects in 1967 in Stuttgart, in Berlin, in Paris, were trained as idiots, as people who must not look at architecture. <coughs> 
be not sensitive to beauty. If love is suggested by an object, go away from it, because you can't do it. That was a message of education. Whereas when you love something, when you have talent in music, you want to play an instrument, not just to listen to it. And people are still born as talents. There are children of five who make music. It's a miracle. It's born every day. Babies are miracles. Because miracles are natural, are not supernatural. And these talents are being killed by education. And a lot of people are, not only that they don't learn anything in schools, anything useful for making them happy, and having lovable lives and interesting lives, but they don't even obey anymore, because that was the main thing which schools were meant to do, to educate slaves who are going to obey to intellectual or body or handwork or digital. And that system is collapsing. So that is what we have to worry about. Because we are an exceptional group of people <coughs> who do what they like. We are incredibly privileged. We haven't had any war. But some of the, our professors in Notre Dame, you know, some of you was thrown 20 meters by a bomb when he was a young person, 18 years old in, uh, in Bayou. Most people here know what war is about. We were incredibly <coughs> Europe was destroyed by unbelievable violence. And now, it's 73 years of, of, of peace. And I'm part of that. So I'm incredibly happy. I have a happy life. I have a fantastic profession. And I wish you know, most people would be as happy as me. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> educated to become slaves. <laughs> Pues eh, si hay alguien entre el público que quiera hacer alguna pregunta, es el momento. Bueno, felicitar a Leon Crier por su lucidez. Eh, realmente poco común. Eh, aparte de las cuestiones estilísticas de su arquitectura, de sus propuestas urbanísticas. Se le oye mejor ahora. Eh, y creo, contrariamente a lo que has dicho como moderador, que eh, realmente el tema de fondo es un tema de resistirse a esta tendencia de la sociedad actual, sobre todo de la occidental, a eh, lo que él llama hacernos eh, esclavizar. Y que no es más que eh, la unión de un capitalismo salvaje con un socialismo también salvaje. Todo esto unido a los progresos, entre comillas, de la ciencia, que nos van a convertir también en parte de esa robótica, introduciéndonos incluso piezas eh, artificiales dentro de estos cuerpos y de nuestras mentes. Bueno, creo que eso es el fondo de la cuestión. Si queremos recuperar una arquitectura verdadera, y es ahí donde hay que luchar contra o con ese mundo político y económico que ahora no entiende estas razones. Um, let me just say something about that. that we, the world is facing a crossroad. Whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you believe that the, the new electronic revolution is changing us inside, whether or not we will have prosthesis of electronics, all of this is going to be happening. I mean, it, 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 and we are facing the, an existential crisis about humanity. Do we want to remain to be the humans who we have been for you know, hundreds of thousands of years, or will we accept to, to be altered in some way? Um, so back to architecture. Uh, you know, I don't like the idea of talking about styles. I mean. It, I think it's okay if you follow a pattern book, if you're doing a piece of architecture in a particular <coughs> culture. But it really has to come out of a broader ethos, an ethos of construction, uh, understanding nature, our nature as humans, and how we're wired, and how we engage and navigate, and how we engage each other. The fact that we are social creatures, <coughs> that we are also private creatures, that you know, walls, openings, and roofs, like Alberti had talked about the way in the 1400s, uh, makes um, modulates the public and private realms. So all of these issues, from our relationship to our planet, to our nature, to our agriculture, to <coughs> our interrelationships, to the young and the old, 
which actually had a balance because the old people watched the young people and the middle people kind of worked it all out. So everything was in a balance. And that balance has been dismissed as being sort of passé. Uh, but we have to come back to that. If we're going to, as architects, our craft is to craft the public and private realm. Sometimes it's vernacular, sometimes it's monumental, sometimes it needs to be just rustic and simple. But it, it, it doesn't come out of a Mediterranean pattern book or a uh, <coughs> New England pattern book. It comes out of what do you have nearby? What is the most sustainable and durable way that you can build? What does the local culture tell you? And you know whether you want to call that style or something else, uh, that, that's fine. But I think the word style has been kind of misused. If I could just make a little bit of a digression here, I'll, I'll keep it short. In, in a global world, in fact, Leo was saying this earlier this morning, you know, we, we can go to Japan and understand what the public architecture, the sacred architecture, and the private architecture is. Nobody tells to tell us what it is. And the same thing for every culture in the world. But also, what, uh, and that's because there's this thing called typology, which, you know, building types, you know, public buildings, sacred buildings, private buildings. But we also can understand the distinctiveness of place through you know, the character. Uh, so character gives the identity of place. It comes from local traditions. It comes from local materials, climates, blah, blah, blah. You've all heard it before. But style is about the individual's contribution to uh, a culture. So style is what makes two buildings built in the same village look different because the people who designed them make them a little different. So I think if we started thinking about how we're all unified in the planet through typology, how each culture is made distinctive by character, and how we each individually contribute to that character through style, I think then we begin to create a world in which we understand the role of the, pro of the individual, the community, and the larger planet, which I think today we have to. So that's my good point. <laughs> Una pregunta más. Thank you. Bien. Eh, yo quería decir una cosa un poco más sencilla. Es que como arquitecto que practico, eh, yo creo que es importante comprender que más y más y más los clientes, la gente, nos pide que hacemos cosas con que se identifiquen, que, que estén en un lugar y que sientan que la casa que, que habitan, los lugares donde, donde se abrigan, sean algo que tiene que ver con su propia cultura. Y eso yo creo que tiene que ver con estilo, respondiendo a tu pregunta. Y creo que es muy importante que los arquitectos saiban comprender lo que hace ese estilo de lugar para lugar, porque es siempre diferente. Y yo creo que ahí hay un importantísimo papel que tiene que desarrollar la escuela. Y esto que estamos aquí viviendo, como ustedes saben, es rarísimo en Europa. No se puede hacer mucho este tipo de discusiones en las escuelas de arquitectura en Europa. Y eh, eh bien, yo creo que eso es necesario porque estamos formando arquitectos que no están bien preparados para responder a todas estas cuestiones, no solo de cosas climáticas o de um, todo, todos esos temas que estu estuvimos hablando, más para las necesidades que la gente sin siente. Eh, la gente quiere una casa con que se identifique, que, es, que pertenece a un lugar que no sea algo pues, que, que va a satisfacer mucho el ego del arquitecto, pero que no le sirve bien. ¿Una pregunta más? I think style is the I always tell my students, style is the least of your worries. <laughs> Because whatever you do, you have style. 
if you speak a language, you always have your own way of speaking. And when you listen to somebody on the phone, you know who is, who is talking. So whatever you do, even if you repeat something, you, know, you play a piece of piano, it becomes your piece with the mistakes and the expression and so on. It's never the same. And so even if we repeat patterns in language, the same in art. If you repeat a, a form, it becomes your own, whether you like it or not. And then, of course, it's a truth that somebody is good at something, and maybe he can be terribly ambitious, but very bad at what he likes to do. I'm a musician as well, but I'm not a musician, because there are my limits. And I've been playing the most difficult music in 50 years, trying and played now for 70 years the piano. But when I hear a real musician, I always wonder, how do they do? <laughs> to play so many notes with that speed, all by memory. But we are doing that, I look at the building, five minutes, and I can draw it inside and outside, without looking at it. So the pianist cannot do that. Or the, and that is why talent, and that is what traditional societies do. They respect, they love children in what they are, not what the parents want them to be. <coughs> and that was common in all, all humanity before industrialization. Because every child is a, <coughs> is a human being, an incredible talent in something. But if that talent is not revealed, he becomes an idiot and a slave. And we were invited to China to a conference of designers with Massimo Scolari and famous people. And then after three days of a lot of BS talk and you know, what they talk about in design conferences, finally the audience of 3,000, they were allowed to ask a question. <coughs> there was no question. There was no question. Please, is there somebody here who has a question? We were talking how China could become autonomous in design. And then finally somebody got up and said very, very modestly, Professor Scolari, could you explain to us how we come, how I can become famous? <laughs> that is the problem. If you, are, if you are good at something, you will become famous, if you are really good. If you try to do something you are not good at, you will just be forgotten. Or you become modernist artist who, who sells in the Queen's Gallery, an exhibition without object. An empty room was an exhibition, an art historical sensation, an exhibition So better become real artist. Where is the other It's all right. I'm done. <laughs> and we have talent here. You saw it this morning. These incredible people who probably did not, they were not taught classical architecture. I know they were not. But they have developed their talent and they do beautiful things. And not just now, but we saw their first schemes in the competition three years ago. Fantastic. Never done. So they are real talents. And, and that is why it is so important to push talent, to encourage it. No. Bueno, levantamos la sesión, no sé si quieres avisar de... ¿No hay más comentarios? Bueno, pues eh, gracias a todos. Muchísimas gracias. Mañana seguimos, que esperamos veros aquí otra vez y que esperamos que sea tan divertido como hoy. Eh, y dar de nuevo gracias a la escuela, porque realmente sí. creo que en muy, pocos, en muy pocas escuelas de arquitectura del mundo se pueden tener debates tan divertidos. Eh, creo que esto es muy bonito, ¿no? que haya opiniones tan diversas. Y esto es algo que, que creo que no sé, quizá el tamaño y la masa crítica de esta escuela permite ¿no? tener mucha variedad de ideas y opiniones que, que se representaban incluso aquí, ¿no? como había distintas opiniones sobre temas 
bastante eh, de actualidad. Y bueno, gracias también al moderador por, por emprender el debate. Muchas gracias a todos. La escuela estaba realmente encantada de recibir este debate, sobre todo porque pienso que es muy necesario y porque eh, yo no sé si la línea o la idea o el concepto de cómo se deben hacer las cosas de los que están aquí representa el pasado o representa el futuro. Pero la escuela eh, tiene que estar siempre en ese cruce en el que como un Jano Bifronte se ve el pasado y el futuro al mismo tiempo para poder posicionar a nuestras gentes en el mundo en el que tienen que hacer. He querido intervenir en temas de responderte a ti, en preguntas que hacías, eh, sobre todo porque probablemente Javier lo llevó muy bien y llevó muy bien cuando dijo, cuando estaba ridiculizando sistemas en los Emiratos porque él no estaba hablando de formas, estaba hablando de, de sistemas, y de sistemas de vivir, y de sistemas eh, sostenibles y de modelos de ciudad que se adaptan a climas eh, distintos, cambien o no cambien, y querido, e pur si mueve, el clima está cambiando. Pero, pero eh, ahí es algo en lo que tenemos eh, que apostar. Yo sí tengo claro que eh, los estilos, las arquitecturas tienen que ver con las culturas pero lo que no tengo claro es que respondan a una única codificación de esas culturas y también pienso que puede ser movidos y reinterpretados y no reinterpretados solamente mediante copias y me estoy mojando muchísimo dentro de una conversación en la que lo que estoy es muy contento de que esta conversación exista y de que todos ustedes estén aquí y le terminaré proponiendo al Dean de Notre Dame que hagamos por supuesto un intercambio entre las dos escuelas de profesores y de estudiantes puesto que si Notre Dame está experimentando en todas estas historias eh, y está siendo tan abierta a todo tengo claro que parte de mis profesores y de mis estudiantes estarán interesados en estar allí o en venir los suyos a la mía Muchísimas gracias a todos